so what I'll say is this about the book. Um, it started as my MFA thesis. Uh, I did an MFA out at CalArts under Steve Erickson, who's a very cool uh, uh, writer. And um, I started there, and the section I'm actually going to read today is sort of the core or a heart of it. And it, it was the thing that was my MFA thesis there, but it really takes place in the middle of the book. And what the story about is this. It's narrated by a guy who, when he was unborn, when he was still in his mother's womb, a small but very uh, upcoming corporation named Singularity Inc. Incorporated uh, made a deal to his parents who he suspects were impoverished because he never gets to meet them. And the deal was that they would give him $50,000 and the eventual uh, free ride to the eventual college of the child's choice if they could have the naming rights of the child. So they go for it, obviously, wanting, probably needing money. And this is the 1980s, 50000 bucks is worth way more than it is today. And they end up naming the child after themselves. So the child's name is Singularity Inc. And it's, it's obviously a creative promotional kind of thing that they want to do, all right? This kid becomes living advertising. And a couple of things go awry, though. First, um, his mother dies in childbirth. And then, uh, as he hears it, his father uh, ends up committing suicide out of a broken heart about two weeks later. So what you have is this child who's been named after a corporation that is basically an orphan. And what the company realizes is it's in their best interest that he lives out a good life. Now, could you imagine if you're a company and you are tied to this child forever because he's named after you and he ends up being a crackhead living on Skid Row? Wouldn't look too good on the company, would it, right? Hi, Singular Link, we're the guy that named a crackhead. Uh, it wouldn't be too good. So, so they realize that they have a vested interest in his outcome and his future, so they move to adopt him. And they take this unusual case of a corporation wanting to adopt a child all the way to the Supreme Court, and they win in a five narrow 5-4 five, decision. And so he becomes not only the first person named after a major corporation, but also one raised by it. The first 120 pages or so of the book is his details, his sort of freaky and very strange upbringing. Because he grows up in the company tower. They have a headquarters. It's a tower. It has nine stories. And he grows up on the top floor. They change it into a sort of penthouse where he lives with his caretakers. Uh, and so the first 120 pages are kind of what that's about and what that's like. Uh, and it's, it's strange. Uh, I mean, even I wrote it and I even know it's strange. Um, then after that, what happens is he goes off to college. And this is when he sort of goes through that rebellious phase that I think everybody goes through that many of you, you probably have just gone through not recently. And that is when you're a teenager, you begin to rebel against your parents. Uh, you know, even if you love them and if everything's good, there's still this sort of tension. Because what you're doing as a teenager is you're forming your sense of self your own sense of identity, and that's something distinct from what your parents are. So there's always a tension. Sometimes it's just very subtle and it works itself out well. Sometimes it's, it's very drastic. And he goes through this later when he goes to college. He wants to identify himself as apart from the company. Um, so after college, he ends up moving into a house with his college roommate. And that's where I'm going to be in writing, uh, reading. The section today is the first part of his life after college. So, this takes place on January 5th, 2005. I graduated in May from Binghamton University with a BA in bollocks, as my British friend Dunhill would put it, meaning a double major in English and philosophy. Then my roommate, Ogre, and I moved back to Novus Novus. We were full of anti-establishmentarian pride, manifesting in a slacker's grin at a lack of a firm plan for graduate success. I got a job delivering pizzas. Ogre worked in a warehouse as a graveyard shift guard, watching boxes, reading books, and smoking too much weed. We rented an old Riverside Victorian in a gothic state of ruin, peeling white paint and shutters half-hanging, a drainage gutter spine-bent into the yard, a front porch with a gaping floorboard entrance to a raccoon nest. We did nothing to fix this. The rear of the house, sorry, was stilted above the banks of the lower Niagara River with a small balcony off the den overlooking a dock nine stories below, which was conveniently tucked inside a small, thickly vegetated inlet. The landlord was a shady Canadian who didn't mind our decadent lifestyle, as long as we didn't attract the fucking police. We got on well, even when he ordered us to destroy the house. It was around 5 p.m. on January 4th, I think. 
Half the house was still asleep. The rest were wandering around trying to fix themselves up into waking, nuking instant coffee, stirring tan crystals into Andrea's champagne, opening counts of discount beer from Milwaukee. We had been stuck riding out a snowstorm for days now. Thirteen remnants of a wild New Year's Eve party, kind of sort of trapped in a house by a flurry, fury of lake effect snow. We could have shoveled our way out if we wanted to, if we cared. Uh, the snow came down for nearly a week, then suddenly stopped. It happened just like that. One afternoon, the world cleared and stilled, took a moment to preen in the January light, then inhaled a deep breath and blew out a poltergeist of winds. This was the night the remnants of our New Year's Eve party decided to drop acid. Ogre, my housemate, Selica, my flavor of the week, the Brits Dunhill and Lexus, and others whose names I never caught or lost, and, and oh yeah, Somnolent Stu, whose real name is Jeff. I rolled out of bed, paused to appreciate the cream of Selica's ex exposed thigh, then stretched, scratched my right ass cheek, and took a quick medicinal hit off my brass one-hitter, then wandered out to the living room to look out the window. Yep, it was still there. A hundred meters down the road was the same sky-blue VW van that had been there for over a week. We never saw anyone enter or leave. It didn't belong to anyone in our neighborhood. The bare mystery of it was enough for a group of revelers to adopt it as an essential element to their drama. It became part of the party. Bottles clanked to its health. Answers of who, what, why were regularly met by the FBI, CIA, ATF, KGB, MI5, ABC, CNN, a gang of neurotic Marthas from the home shopping network spying on those zany kids for tips into the Vanguard cool. Flimsy plastic red cups are going to be all the wave next season. And look, ping pong balls instead of little umbrellas. We had no idea who owned it. Sometimes it would disappear only to reappear again when I looked back out the window. We wondered how it made it through the snow. Ogre said German engineering. Hitler had ordered the first VWs into birth. It'd been here since just after Christmas, appearing the day after our Canadian landlord, Mar Mari Villapen, called and ordered us to destroy the house. Ogre took the call and then repeated it maybe a dozen times over the following week, inflecting Mari's words with an absurdum of exaggerated Quebecois. Okay, I have to do a really bad, fake French accent. If you're French, don't be offended by this. It's supposed to be character trick. Le jeu sont fait, boys. Le jeu sont fait. I don't have time to talk. Those pig swine, those fucking pig swine fuckers. Listen now, boys. Those pig fuckers caught up to me in my operations. They are ruined. But Mari is too clever for them. Yes, they don't catch me. But hey, they know my, my, my American business now. It is Ottawa and Washington working together, the fascist fucking swine. Anyway, you must move soon, I think. The FBI will be crashing in on you and how you say, seizing all, do me not. Okay, listen now, you pig fuckers. I know you are there. Not you, those fucking, not you boys, those fucking Yankee swine listening in. You listen now, yes. These boys are good boys. They have no knowledge of my business. Mari, tell them nothing. Mari, pay them nothing. I don't need to, yes? That pretty one with Le Vassage Renon, he may be richer than Mari, I think. They just renters, smart boys who like to drink and lay with the women. Mari likes them for this, so Mari rents his house cheap. I tell these boys nothing. I tell them stay out of the fucking basements or I'll cut off your fucking balls. They smart college boys, they know go down there. Are you listening now, you ass-sucking fascist pigs? Your president is an imperialist bastard with a small cock, eh? He ran bombs on the children because he can't give it good to his wife, yes? Comment? Mad. Trois minutes. Okay, so you listen good. These boys just dumb Americans like you, renting the house. You plug them into the polygraph if you want. They know nothing, you fuckers. So, boys, you listen up now. This is the reason Mari called. The house, she will be the American soon. So Mari say you trash the fucking place. Get all your friends together. Logar knows all the crazy ones, yes? You do this and drink it to the fucking ground. A toast to Mari Villapen. Raise the fucker. Leave nothing for those bastards to confiscate. Comment? Quatre minute. Mad. The thing is, Mori mostly talk like this. If he were a cartoon character, he'd be short and stocky with a dark beard and wires of hair jutting out his pad plaid collar. Be leaning on a double-bladed axe. Start conversations with ha ha ha. And Mari did sort of look like this, except he wore white thermals instead of flannel shirts and said, fucking shit, instead of, oh, 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 as in, fucking shit. How are you, boys? I am here for the rent, but soon I must go. You have a beer for Mari? Reality is always the vulgarity of the image. Or is the image the vulgarity of reality? Fucking shit. Anyway, the loose assumption was that the van outside was some federal agency on a stakeout, the FBI or the ATF. Maybe even the Treasury Department sitting there waiting for Mari to show up for something valuable in the basements. Nobody wondered why the government would use a German automobile. Signs of authority promote criminal thinking. 
When you approach a bank teller and notice a camera pointing at you from above, you think about robbery. Add an uninhibiting agent to the mix, like alcohol, and thought floods to action. Stick your thumb up and point a finger at the teller. Say, this is a stick-up, and smile. Confess to tipping a few margaritas back at lunch. With the blue van in, our ba in the background, our New Year's Eve party turned into a brouhaha of escalating chaos, an unspoken game of what can we do before they raid the place. We rolled 20 kegs in through the front door with broad smiles and jumping jack waves. We posted 3806 Riverside on the internet with free beer and enormous scrolling text. We called everyone we knew and told them to call everyone they knew who were to call everyone they knew ad infinitum. The turnout was incredible despite the weather. The walls perspired with overcrowding. Countless items were broken, stolen, abused. I found a mosaic of fruit punch and feces in the third floor bathroom with a defiled food processor in the sink, a hairdo of Q-tips stuffed in its jaws. Twenty or so people knew about the van. The rest were just towed by the tide. My stereo was so loud the kitchen shelves bombed people's heads with pots. When we ran out of cups, they drank beer from the pops. pots. People climbed up the porch and did backflips into the snow. Binghamton Sigma Nu chapter road tripped up with necks full of plastic bling. They directed an impromptu game of Mardi Gras with people showing sex parts for necklaces to synchronize chants. Two girls made out on the living room couch and a small crowd gathered to watch, the boy-girl ratio roughly 7 to 1. Two men made out by the television and were respectfully ignored. Outside, the van refused to blink. An ecstasy tangle formed in Ogre's bedroom, a knot of 20-something limbs, uh, twenty something sweaty limbs and heads all rubbing and writhing and kissing and licking, while a bemused ogre and a 16-year-old girl sat in the corner spinning a twister wheel, shouting out chance choreography. The limbs mostly ignored them. Somebody bet Ogre he couldn't tear out the second-floor toilet. He won. Water sprayed everywhere, and people showered beer over each other with a collective whoop. We took turns throwing it through every window of the second floor, the assembled crowd blowing kazoos and, no and cranking noisemakers with each ejection. Time evaporated. Nobody knew if the calendar had flipped to 2005. This question became so overheard that it took on the power of a general theme. Losing time is always... Oh, the New Year's Eve party that forgot the new year. Losing time is always an indicator of having a good time. At one point, I paid a dime bag to a soft olive-skinned boy to strip naked and run around the van three times. Nothing happened. Occasionally, someone would see spot wisps of smoke sneaking out its tailpipe. Selica suggested we just go out and introduce ourselves, but Ogre and I preferred the mystery, a tangible piece of fate there for the taunting. Days passed, and the party whittled down to 13 people. The snow stopped falling. The winds came. We all dropped acid. Skip ahead just a bit. After showering, I woke up uh, Selica. We wake and bake, then sucked down some filthy instant java and joined everyone in a circle on the living room floor. The room was a play of candlelit shadows, nine or ten of them orbiting in waxy decay. Selica had come to the house with her, friend, with her roommate from Skidmore, who was a friend of one of Ogre's friends, all of whom had left days ago. She was an A student majoring in business management and held unrealistic aspirations to be a model-slash-actress-slash-cosmetic model spokesperson. It's not that she wasn't beautiful. She was but she was also 21 years old and committed to college and couldn't see the contradiction of this. To model is to submit yourself to the old mind-body dichotomy. Models start at 15 and don't go to college until their skin stops breathing that factory fresh glow, usually sometime in their mid to late 30s, give or take a decade for genetics, drug addiction, as well as various shriveling disorders of dislove, fingers down the throat, laxative meals, etc. Only then do they go back to college to graduate and become designers and mentors for 15-year-old models. Selica idolized model, actress, cosmetic spokesperson, smokeswoman, uh, smokeswoman, Tyra Banks, because she had a physicality Selica yearned to replicate and thus identified with. In reality, they looked almost nothing alike except through the weavings of design, hair, cosmetics, clothing, a sense of blackness. Selica was a meticulous satellite of Tyra's product use and gestures, and she was beautiful. I don't mean to suggest otherwise. Gorgeous, in fact. Right down to the meticulous way she bore her tightly drawn being. Attention clenched Selica in fists of neurosis. It was as if through the digestion of Tyra's broadcast there came, also came the grinding byproducts of fame. Her eyes fretted over what people thought of her, not just her beauty, though she undoubtedly worried about that, but what her beauty meant, how it was perceived. Did she seem vapid or ditzy? Did she seem caught up in the regurgitant industry of feminine abuse? Was she projecting the proper image of an intelligent, self-aware model? Did she appear strong? Did she appear too strong? 
Celica was like a doll trying to crawl out of its own plastic shell, a gorgeous skin of ornate design that she herself had built and thus loved far too much to ever crack, and so was left sliding her hands compulsively along the walls of self-prison. I was attracted to her for the obvious boner value, initially spying her across a crowded room holding a plastic cup up high with a thin bent arm, like it was a martini glass on the cover of High Society. Wait, isn't that a porn magazine? But I was drawn to her for the collegiate path she had chosen, the far-flung dreams of owning her own fashion design business that she confessed during our first night together. This was something I planned on telling her every night during our postcoital unfolding. She needed to know how valuable it was to have a choice, the immense beauty of democratic self-destiny, instead of being born into your future like some wretched prince. But I kept falling asleep before getting around to it, her fingers massaging my hair into dreams. Ogre's blue bong was making its way around the circle. Everyone quieted in respect for the knight's first toke. Victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools, said Ogre. Pension, answered Dunhill in a, deep, a voice deep like a Congolese warlord's, except he's from London, so every syllable was tweaked with perceived pronunciation. I found something unbelievably sexy about this. He caught me staring and smiled. Pension lacks the necessary pessimistic lust, said Ogre. Recite it again, will you, said Dunhill. Ogre fired up another bong hit and blew out. The field only reveals to man his own folly and despair, and victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools. Percy, then. Ogre responded with a quiz show. Nah, nah. I say, young Master Dunhill, he smirked, I feel your feel for the Yanks is utterly reprehensible. If I didn't know better, I'd say you did nothing but smoke marijuana while studying in the States. Dunhill had been an exchange student in our dorm at Binghamton freshman year. He threw an empty beer can over Ogre's head, who made an exaggerated act of ducking. Anyone else? asked Ogre. He leaned back on his elbows, sending his monstrous gut flopping out. Nobody answered. Ogre had the melon of a head topped by a paper crown from a fast food meal. The man possessed the frame of a pro wrestler, which bore its 250 pounds with the type of insouciant grace found in hillbillies or foreign dignitaries or unsteroided pro wrestlers, men who don't care for one reason or another. The weight mostly settled in his gut, but the confidence of his bearing made you think that there was a secret to this monstrosity, something you didn't quite get but should. A radical new diet or exercise routine you wanted in on, one that first destroyed the body in order to rebuild it properly. From a distance, he was easily dismissed as a rube, a fleshy mass shaped by an ethos forever caught in fast food lines, a refusal to exercise, scoffs at salary sticks, stocks instead of fast food chip, or instead of paper chip, potato chips. The fast food crowd only confirmed this, as did the filthy white t-shirt, the unkept beard, the kitchen sheared blonde hair, all advertising for an ignorant roué, an, an ogre. It was a trap for people whose etched physiques were an inextricable part of their urbane self-worth. To them, this barbarian was something to mock and ignore, the negative print of all things intelligent and productive. Then he spoke. He was just, likely to, just as likely to quote Kwa Xing as to pick his nose or urinate in the corner. He pissed in the corner because his bladder was full. He recited esoteric philosophers because, well, I guess sort of the same reason. He did a four-year stint in the U.S. Army before our four years together at Binghamton University, and thus was older than us, nearing his thirties. He also didn't build his body as a trap. Its fleshy slide held deeper self-meanings, one long buried under an ever-increasing mass towards death. He was my best friend, the only one I ever had. It was only natural that we'd move in together after graduating college. The ironic part is that most people assumed he was the one following me because I had the face and the money. Nobody, he asked again. The circle slipped into that ponderous silence that bridges trivia answers to their question, uh, trivia questions to their answers. I found myself waiting for Ogre to belch or fart or rub his genitals. Then this long-haired surfer stoner guy lit a cigarette, flaring away the room's dim harmony. Faces tensed and posture shifted. Ogre ambled back up. Selica's hands fidgeted around in her lap. Dunhill went rigid, as if somebody had yelled, Red light! And he was stuck in the lotus position, waiting for somebody to yell, Green light! The lighter's flame went out, and everybody eased back into themselves. Things are so emphatic on acid. The drug is an inverted melodrama, in the strictest sense of the word, the way a depressed man in a bad movie is always walking down an uh, empty street during a steady downpour. Except with LSD, it works in the opposite direction. It's raining and dark, so the man's mood grows gloomy and isolated. It's mythological this way, the rain and lightning and oceans and deserts and wild winds setting the tone of things, not the world machined in human logos. It's no wonder people connect religion with hallucinogens. 
The old house's bones creaked against the wind. Faulkner, I said. Ding, ding, ding. That old drunken ratiocination of the, of the cell. Give the man a bong hit. I took the bong and tried to think of something prosaic to say, coming up with, What's up, Doc? I didn't say this aloud. What a nimcow poop. What an ignoramus. Somebody made a wisecrack about Southerners involving incest and animal noises. I looked over at Celica. Boredom was starving the glow of her face. I wanted to lick her cheek until I stared at it a little too long, and it began to melt. We had near-identical noses, the erupt aerodynamic slant of a Kenyan sprinter. Mine's a bit longer and finer cut. I watched her talk to the surfer stoner guy. As I watched her talk to the surfer stoner guy, I waved phantom feelers through her every gesture, the slight tilt of her head after his comments, the frictionless slide of her hands over her knees, everything about her seamless and patient. Ogre nudged me. He put a palm over his crotch and made a couple, a couple of quick, snapping hip thrusts. I mouthed the words. Celica didn't notice. Everyone had drifted off into their own conversational spheres. The big lug made a salicious half grin, and I punched him in the arm while catching my eye on the firefly of the surfer stoner's cigarette. Then an empty beer bottle. Then, the br then a bright red candy bar wrapper. Then the room at large. It was mammoth and cluttered. The refuge had gathered and vomited spurts over the week, only to be pushed to the outer edges as we made space to make more garbage. Plastic cups of stale beer, dead balls on their sides, bags of fast food debris, cigarette butts strewn about like machine-gunned rabbit droppings, the pall of their spirits hazing up the air into a nice, healthy smog. If I hadn't been living in it for the week, it smelled like the gin-dose furnace of a crematorium, a witch's brew of death and regurgitated alcohol, all puke clean, but with traces of bile in the bite of its odor. In fact, this is exactly how it smelled during my morning stumble to the bathroom. But I adjusted. We all did. Some animals are excellent scavengers, others cunning predators. Humans are adapters. We like to bitch and moan, but the truth is we'll quickly adapt to most anything, even if it's killing us. I survived by keeping the personal space in my bedroom clean and getting stoned each morning before I left. But after six or seven days, it grew too much. Unless I was really buzzing, the decay sent out woolen threads that itched along my body, pushed things inward, made the world barren and nauseating. I began stepping through the house on my toes, overconscious of anything wet or crinkly, wore sunglasses to dim the stark reality of it all. It took more than a moaning toke then, a wicked mimosa, strong bourbon, anything numbing and toxic. Then it was home again. Celica took a dose of antidepressants each morning. Ogre kept a bottle of bourbon next to his bed. We all have our paths to equilibrium. It's easier to destroy yourself than fix the world around you. Mari said the government was going to seize it all anyway, so what the hell? Better to trash it than watch it become a piece of unlived equity, i.e. better dead through decadence, that bursting bottle rocket of life, than a long, mirthless afterlife in some wanker's account book. The floorboards vibrated with the furnace kicking in. I suddenly realized that I'd fallen out of the loop and struggled for a conversation to join, hearing everything at once. Never waver on that. It's best novel. I love hash. Hash is so much better than weed. So tastier, stronger, smells better, less spicy, and more fragrant. And so versatile. You can do anything with hash. Wow, you look, at that, you look like that guy in that movie. Beer, anyone? Here, here. Yo, Faulkner was self-indulgent. Who writes like that anymore? Who drinks Old Crow anymore? It's the silly putty drug. So many things you can do with it. So many ways to smoke it, like hot knives. Hot knives? That guy from that one Tarantino movie. What's it called again? Tony Morrison writes like Faulkner. Roll your hash up into little balls and put them on a plate. Fire up a stove. Gas or electric? Wow. Willie Mays is making an over-shoulder catch inside the shadows over there. Look at that, right on the wall. Acid rules! I'd rather see Derek Jeter from behind. One word, hot! Doesn't matter. Get yourself two butter knives you won't be needing. Put them on the other burner and, get them, uh, and let them get hot until the ends are red. Morrison is a clear product of her era. Ever notice how many veins are in your hand? Bright blue veins? Wow! Oh, God, that whole grammar meltdown thing in the bluest eye? They made us read that in freshman lit. I'm so tired of experimentation. Who has the time? While writers were wanking new ways to say things, TV and advertising perfected a quick-fire language that refuses to let go, pulls you right in. This is why we all watch TV. The ad companies know us better. They have the ability to speak to our lives in under 20 seconds. 20 seconds! That's amazing when you think about it. Writers are totally beginning to admit this in their style, too. The whole school of writing that strives for your attention with every single line. They grab hold of you from the start. Refuse to let go. Refuse to let you put the book down on that new release's shelf. What's wrong with that? Nothing. I didn't say anything was wrong with it. 
ever drop hot wax on your face? Well, how about your nipples? Woo, kinky. Whatever. It's all about advertising. TV shows advertise the commercials that advertise the product. Drama is just an extended ad set. This is why they're all written with that manic need to keep your attention, to pull you in. Like she said, to refuse to let you go. Get you to the ads that get you to the product. Wow, you must really hate TV. Nah, I'm just a self-aware junkie. I love TV. Who doesn't love TV? You should see how many veins are in my cock. No thanks, ass. Advertising uses images more than words. It's about the snazzy clip, the cool snapshot, the in-now music driving the vibe, dreams made real, now. Ads don't offer desire, they are desire. Floyd, True Romance, Brad Pitt, get some, get some beer and some cleaning products. You're the spitting image of them. Someone say they wanted another beer? Called a voice from the kitchen. My mouth tastes all acidity or acidity or acid or acid or acid, 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 acid. Hey, is that why they call it acid? Acid, 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 acid. Experimentation isn't good product anymore. And product is the spirit of the age. What's the German again? Spirit of the age? Images, words, what's the diff? Whoa. Hey, Brad Pitt's hot too. You go. Celica winked at Floyd, the surfer stoner guy. Brad Pitt likes hash, I told her. How do you know? I smoked with him. She raised brows and frames of bullshit, but then tilted her head slightly toward me. A single second exploded. A couple summers ago at a publicity event for Singularity in L.A., total insurance seminar bullshit until Brad whips out a bowl. I'm an exquisite liar. Years of publicity training can turn even a Boy Scout into a well-oiled publicist. Plus, my image holds enough plausibility for almost anything. I don't even have to try anymore. My name is the truth before a single word is uttered. Whoa. Miss Morrison transcends her age, like all good art does. What you are saying is like comparing Thomas Pynchon to the worst of postmoderns. What is postmodern? Something that came after modern, but before the current after after Martin, Ogre answered. Which, of course, is after irony with sincerity, as seen in clever memoir masturbations of identity-based predicaments in a, well, postmodern world. Just mark off all the checkboxes of our nouned being. One man's travails as a white meaning German English, meaning Prussian Hario, and Norman and Norman Scottish Ashanti, dash Hispanic, meaning Puerto Rican, meaning Tiano Spandard African, meaning Roman Moorish Jewish, and Fulani Ashanti, meaning, oh, fuck, this gets so confusing as you delve into the blood like a lineage-obsessed Arthurian. Or actually, make that skin, not blood, because that's what we're really talking about here. Giving a name to a physicality, a label, set for, uh, a label for a set of features so people can spot you in a crowd and lump you into the appropriate tribe. But don't pry too deep, because then you'll hit pedigree collapse and break the skin to reveal the real blood. That old genetic sauce that bleeds ruby no matter what the old melon says. No good, no good. The image must justify the origins. The origins don't justify the image. Lexus rolled her eyes. Ogre smirked. And oh yeah, he continued, 62% of his boners come from looking at shorn male asses, so be sure to check that homosexual box. Right. So it's a memoir about this. Let's call him Homo White Hispanic. And how he gets shit on over and over by the world. The bitterness and resentment and triumphs of this. Somewhere along the way defining what it is to be a checkbox Homo White Hispanic for others. The memoirist now chief of a whole new tribe via the power of the word. Perhaps one day an official checkbox on a government survey, instead of having to fill in the other line. He wedged his beer between his legs and cupped his mouth into a fanned microphone. Attention, Walmart shoppers! The centers are now holding. He covered the top of his fist with his other hand and whispered to his right. What? We need more centers? Impossible. We already have enough departments. Just cram those coffee-colored ones into black. Those sallow ones into white. Those, oh my god, what the hell, are those people fondling each other's testicles? Never mind. Hispanic or Asian, pick one and lump them in with the gays by the garden center. The centers are holding. The centers are holding. What? One of them claims he's a 38% hetero, 62% homo white Hispanic? What the hell is that? Well, what color is he? Never mind. Just toss him, in, toss him into bisexual. No, I don't care if they're all women. Ogre picked up his beer and smirked. The wind slammed into the window, causing a hollow twang I felt in my chest. The candle should have fluttered to accent this violence, but didn't. Also, he continued, if you're a total snot, you could take a few jabs at the industriness, interest, industriness of the publishing industry. You know, to lament the inscapability of, he made a couple of bobbing quotation marks in the air, the system. Another ogre smirk. Not that Metaproduct escapes the system, it's just a gambit used to ease the author's conscience at being a complicitous schmuck. Get with the times, my urbane Londoner. Don't you know the spirit of the age is all post-postmodern? Which isn't a name, but only a term whispered with nervous discontent. 
Because that witty critical title we're all waiting for hasn't arrived yet. And this is what we crave with nervous desperation, the label that refuses to arise, one that doesn't step out to pompously announce its wittiness but flows naturally from the world, emerges without a doubt, overwhelms the democracy of over-information, which is hilariously the very thing that both desires the label and prevents it from coming. We're all in post-pomo. He raised his beer and looked off in the distance. All epic, when fist on his hip, a pose for posterity. Rigid as bronze, then collapsed into an ogre smirk, which fails miserably as a witty label. But naturally I meant that, in post-pomo, IPP. God, I have a killer urge to beat my cock off right now. He adjusted his fast food crown, sat back, and grinned. Ogre, chief of all pale penis smartasses. Then he rolled his eyes back into his head and started pumping his fist over his crotch. Oh yeah, that's it, baby. Hail to the chief. Dunhill, I, and a few others burst out laughing. Lexus looked at Ogre with the numb amazement of a woman just called a cunt by a three-year-old child. Have you even read memoirs? Selica asked. Ogre squinted an eye outer. Fist paused mid-stroke. I like them, or the ones I read. They're just people looking for meaning in a big, crazy world. They're more creative than reality TV, you know. Do you happen to have a mirror on you? Ogre asked her. It'd make this a lot easier. Then he reclosed his eyes and jerked his fist even faster. Selica tensed her jaw in an attempt to prevent a smile. She lost. You are such an ass. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, claps from all over out there. Um, so, I mean, if you guys, especially the creative writing people here, if you have any questions whatsoever, anything that's popping in your head, I'll do Q&A. I'm actually contracted to do that. I think that they, they told me I have to do that. It's part you're of very, my pay. Very strict. Yes, very, very. There's a program that I have to follow. In fact, I went two minutes over and I thought she was going to shoot me That's from the ground. Yeah, see? Mm -hmm. No, no. I'm still trying to absorb all that. Yeah. yeah, it's overwhelming, isn't it? I, I even feel overwhelmed and I wrote the damn thing. So, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. I noticed this young lady taking copious notes. I honestly, it, it, I'm just curious. What were you writing down? Uh, things that you said that I really liked, like one thing. Oh, like Victorian in a Gothic state of. Oh, so you were trying to catch phrases there, yeah. huh? Good language. You always got to write the language down. That's good stuff. When I first started writing, there was actually an interview out there of me on this. But one of the things that I did when I first started writing is I fell in love with language a lot. And there were certain writers that really, really did it for me. And to this day, whenever I lose the language. I mean, some people write, and they write certain ways. I, I write, I need things to be lyrical. I need it to feel it on a certain level, tact, like, just feel the language as it rolls, in a sense. And I don't always achieve it, but I try to. Um, and when I lose that space, that place where I'm in groove with the language, it's maddening. Um, it's like you forgot how to ride a bike. Which is, sounds ridiculous, right? Everybody says, oh, once you learn how to ride a bike, you always can. Well, imagine if all of a sudden your memory got wiped and you couldn't ride a bike. You know, you'd feel like an ass and it would hurt. You'd keep getting on, you'd keep falling off, and that's what it feels like. So the best thing I do is I go back to books that I think have such beautiful language. They're not necessarily, I think, my, the best novels ever written or even always my favorite novels, but they're the ones that are just have such a beauty of language that reading them puts me back in that place. Two of them, I'll tell you right now, one of them is Don DeLillo's Americana, which is his first novel, and it's nowhere near his best, but it's his most purely inspired. It's just incredible. And the other one is uh, a book I'm actually teaching in a class now called uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God by uh, Zora Neely Hurston. You heard that one? Yeah. It's gorgeous. The language is gorgeous, right? Like, I mean... I'm ready yet. It was assigned in English. We're going to read it. Oh my, okay, so listen, this is what I tell my students, I'll tell you this now, okay, you, the, she writes in a southern black dialect, so the, the, um, a lot of times the dialogue, you have to, sh you'll struggle at first with it, all right, put up with it, all right, because after a while what happens is it's like, if you ever studied a foreign language at all, okay, did you get to the point where you're not translating it much anymore, but all of a sudden you have this like miracle moment when you actually think in a sentence of that language, oh, you're not there, all right. I did this with Latin because I'm terrible at languages, and I did this with Latin, and it took me a year to do it. And then one day at like the last week of my second semester of Latin, I read a sentence, and I didn't translate it in my head. I just ran with it. I slipped into its river, 
Like I was swimming with it and everything was cool. That's what will happen when you read Hurston's book. It takes a while because she, she uses all kinds of really weird grammatical constructions in order to capture the dialect of these people. Um, and, and once you slip into it, it's like you're with them. It's amazing. It's really transformative. But that's not why I read it for this and for, for re- writing, though. That's just something she does that's really cool. She's so fucking poetic. She's such a talented writer. And reading the language, just sentence by sentence, it's, you don't, like I said in the interview, there's sentences that you don't read, you savor them. It's like you taste them or you drink them or something like that. Um, and those two books are what do it for me. Uh, if your writers find something that does it for you, I would say that. Uh, find something that does it for you and make that your Bible. Yeah. So I answered my own question. That was pretty good. I got some mileage out of that. Joe, you got anything for me? Um, what gave you the idea, like, you know, the concept of this? Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where it was born. And this doesn't even address really what was going on when I read today. Um, back a while, like 10 years ago, I read a book by uh, Christian Mur- not Christian Murdy. Who was it again? Um, V.S. Ramakadran, who is a neurologist at the time working out of San Diego State. Uh, world famous neurologist, and he, what the cool thing about him is he's a really smart neurologist guy. But he did he would write a lot of books in layman's terms, so that people like me who don't know jack shit about neurology or anything medical could read them and appreciate it and learn something about what's going on in the field. And he was studying epileptics, and epileptics, as you know, are people that have really bad seizures, right? And one of the things he noticed is he was studying them, and he kept hooking up this machine to them called a transcranial magnetic stimulator that actually appears in the book later, uh, where he can sort of see where electrical activity is going on in someone's head. Um, and what he realized is that, well, a seizure is an electrical storm in somebody's head. What happens is we're all made up of electrical signals. A seizure is when it just goes nuts, like nuclear, and there's so many signals you just begin shaking and everything begins moving, and you're totally out of control. The thing that he noticed that was neat is that immediately after a seizure, there was a tendency, though not everybody got this, to have a religious experience. And I found this fascinating for a couple of reasons. One, because he was able to identify the area of the brain that actually lit up during this experience. He called it the God module. And right away, really right-wing fanatic religious people said, oh my God, God's not in the brain, you're terrible. But then a bunch of bishops uh, from a particular bishop from the Catholic Church said, well, well, that makes sense. If God created human beings, why wouldn't he create a, a faculty or an area in your brain to be able to perceive him? So it wasn't really anti-religious. It was just something that he noticed. And this is the thing that got me that I thought was so cool. If you hooked somebody up to this and stimulated artificially, the electronic uh, stimulated the God module, nothing would happen unless he saw something that he believed. So if you had a Christian sitting down and you stimulated the God module and you put like Vishnu in front of him, nothing would happen. You put Ronald McDonald in front of him, nothing would happen. You put a crucifix in front of him, boom! He is convinced utterly and thoroughly, and you will never talk him out of it, that he is in the presence of God. And he feels it everywhere. He feels what's called, what, what, what philosophers like Kant called the sublime. What Rudolf Otto called in his book, The Idea of the Holy, called the numinous, a numinous experience. A numinous experience is an experience of something beyond the world, whether that be divine or whatever it is. And I found that amazing. Not that he found this, but it depended upon belief. So in this book, he has this throwaway comment that explodes and ends up becoming Lost Trademark, the inspiration for it. And he said, he was joking with his assistant, and he said, so what would happen if you, if you, if you uh, stimulated the God module of an atheist? And they laugh in the book. I'm like, ha, 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 and he never answers the question. Lost trademark is the attempt to answer that question, the whole thing, which is why you have a boy who grows up named after a corporation. The part I didn't tell you is the corporation makes him their official logo. Three different logos are taken of his face at ages 5, 13, and 18, are called infant sin, teen sin and adult sin so like every product that you buy of this has his face on it and you can see here this is adult sin actually a guy a design student at my at cal arts designed them for me so that's the little logo of him so like and if you buy a computer instead of like you know a little window thing there's adult sin hair dryers whatever and they end up becoming one of the largest most wealthy multinational corporations in the world producing almost everything from weapons to freaking pooper scoopers and his face is on all of them so really what begins to happen is one he becomes famous all his life 
So you have sort of like the Michael Jackson thing, where he grows up famous and never knows a life without fame. Um, and then you also have the fact that he is a logo all over the place, much like a person but a logo, much like any other corporate logo. And so what happens when you put an atheist, set, sit an atheist down and stimulate their God module and you say, put a model of consumerism in front of them? Will their God module go off? That's an interesting question. And that's what I thought about. And that's why I wanted to write it. And that's where it explores. There's sort of this thing where the book starts. There's this, this, this weird celebrity cult right in the beginning of the book uh, that are trying to recruit him for some reason. And, and this is it. Um, I'm not giving away much in the book and tell you the guy, uh, the, uh, the guy who uh, founded the cult figured out a way to splice and mess with the drug LSD to specifically target the God module. Uh, because when people have taken LSD, they've also had experience. It's widely known. It's been written about by a lot, by Aldous Huxley, for example, the guy that wrote Brave New World, right? That LSD has a tendency now and then, though not always, to produce religious-like experiences. That's why it's been officially classified as an entheogen, which is a word that literally means a drug that can stimulate a religious experience. Uh, peyote does the same thing for, for uh, a certain group of people. Uh, so I thought that was interesting, and that's how I took all these very real science-y kind of things and then just threw it into fiction. Good answer? Yeah. Rock on. All right. Okay. Thank you all for coming, and please tell your creative writing professors, thank you for supporting uh, uh, writing and independent bookstores by sending people here. That's awesome of them. Okay? All right. Thank you.